Stained carpet. That's the nothing personal word of the day. It is Monday, March 11th. I just ripped off my tuxedo, jumped in the shower, and made it here back in the Metal Arc Studios on a Monday morning with Coca producing behind the glass wall together at last. Together at last. The first show we've done since the day CBS kicked us out of the studio in Fort Lauderdale for COVID. That's the last time we were together for a Nothing Personal episode. If you watched Live from the Stained Carpet on Dan Lebetard's YouTube channel, you saw Adnan Verk, Ben Lyons, and I, along with all of the shipping container. Dan made an appearance. Seven hours you stayed with us as we did the pregame. We did the postgame. We did a watch along for the Oscars. We had a record number of people fill out ballots. And I must tell you that not many of you beat me. You all tried as you may, but only 49 out of about 5,600 people beat me. Coca, I had a really good night. I must tell you that I enjoyed it. The best part, I think, was Verk thinking he'd beat me, but he didn't. Ben Lines being despondent, thinking he'd beat me. People may not realize I am quite competitive in everything. I've told you stories that require therapy for both me and my children, but I never wanted them to win at anything. I tried when we played War, Battleship, Stratego, Go Fish, Uno, Old Maid, Tic-Tac-Toe. You don't want to go there, do you? Don't start in the middle. Not good to start in the middle. Oh, they learn pretty quickly. You better start in the middle or you're going to lose. So I had a few hours last night. Coca, you'd be pleased to know that I closed my eyes for a total of about 45 minutes. Why? Because of adrenaline, and I had no ice cream to eat. Two, that's a subtle greenies comment there, Coke. I bet you missed that completely. Missed the greenies, amfettis. I didn't take any greenies. I didn't have any coffee. I didn't move for seven hours. I had cucumber water in the great offices, though there was great catering. I just didn't eat anything. So I couldn't sleep, and there was an Oscar movie. The Oscars were over that I hadn't watched yet that just became available. So of course, in the middle of the night, all crouched in a corner so as not to wake anyone, headphones on, I watched To Kill a Tiger, which is the last documentary feature that I had not seen. Wow, we'll, we'll review that another day because it requires a whole segment. So I wanted to go back off the top and just thank Metal Arc. Dan gave us the keys to his ship. He gave us the access to his audience, and you all responded in ways that were just staggering in terms of concurrent viewership, in terms of number of people who were engaging, audience activation. It was just, it's like we're all a family, so I appreciate that. The downside is I didn't really get to watch the Oscars because I had Mike Ryan in my ear or Roy or Chris or Coca. Coca's always in my ear. I can't get Coca out of my ear at any time. And we had one feed going in where you're hearing talk back from the people you're doing the show with and the broadcast from ABC. I'm the type of guy where I don't go to Oscar parties because I want to watch with volume. It's not like baseball games. People are very, side note, Coca, I watch baseball games on mute. I've talked about this a little on Nothing Personal. I'm not really learning anything from the play-by-play -play people. They're all great. So I'm not in any way impugning, but it just comes from the 18 years of watching games and watching them in a different way. But during the Oscars, I want sound. I want to hear speeches. I want to hear interviews on the red carpet. And so last night, I found myself cobbling together from YouTube clips. I could have recorded it on Hulu. Why didn't I do that? And then watch the whole episode. Instead, I was watching various different clips. And I have a couple of things that need to be spoken about. First of all, I think we have to start with Oppenheimer and just congratulate them. Don't let the Al Pacino situation take away from Oppenheimer winning Best Picture. It's such a conundrum when you produce the Academy Awards. The final award of the night is always Best Picture unless, what's the name, Coca? 
what's the name of the actor who died? He was in Black Panther and he, Chadwick Boseman. Thank you. Unless Chadwick Boseman is supposed to win the Oscar, in which case they do best actor at the end. And then he doesn't win. And it goes to Anthony Hopkins, of course. So best pictures always last. And to do it, you bring in the heavyweights. We were trying to predict before the show who it was going to be. Could it be Jack Nicholson? He doesn't leave his house too often, a bit of an agoraphobe. He's getting up there. Maybe you bring in Clint Eastwood, doesn't make appearances much. How about a Gene Hackman? Somebody of gravitas. It can't be Robert De Niro because he's nominated sitting in the audience. So it's likely not going to be him. So then out comes Al Pacino. And Al Pacino goes and says, best picture. And he's got the envelope. And you're supposed to go through all the nominees. And he didn't list any of the nominees. He went right to the winner. And it was all discombobulated. The producers didn't know what to do. And what happened was Oppenheimer's announced. And then something out of the ordinary took place. The Oscars were done early. So Jimmy Kimmel had to stall for time. Why? They were previewing another episode, not previewing, they were showing another episode of Abbott Elementary after the Oscars. And that needed to start at 10.30 Eastern. Well, this was about 10.22 Eastern. The Oscars have been going on for about 202 minutes. People thought they would never end. It was a slow start, which we'll talk about. So Jimmy Kimmel has to make stuff up and this is what he's good at. So he took out his actual phone and he started reading reviews of his monologue, which was mediocre. Thankless job. It's not easy to have a good monologue. He had a, a drug joke about Robert Downey. Give me a break. We've all done those drug jokes. Don't need it. He was going to win an Oscar. He didn't talk about Aaron Rodgers. Someone had some money on that. I didn't think he would. I thought he could have, but he didn't. So he reads a tweet from Trump saying that he's the worst host of all time and yada, yada, yada. And then the show just ends. And people were talking about Pacino's mistake instead of Oppenheimer's brilliance. Christopher Nolan, the director who could have won for The Prestige, for Interstellar, for Memento, for Inception, finally got his first best director's nod. It's big. But what separated the children from the experts last night and what made so few of you beat me was in the best actress category when I told you that Emma Stone was going to win. And during the live from the stained carpet, I had a take for those of you who weren't watching, it's still available on the Levitard YouTube channel, that Emma Stone is about to become Meryl Streep. And that's the equivalent in sports of saying someone's going to be the next LeBron. Someone's going to be the next Jordan. Sports is full of that. There's always someone. Who's next? Next man up. Next woman up. Emma Stone is 35 years old, and she won her second Best Actress Oscar. Second at 35. She has multiple nominations, two wins. Her range goes from super bad to poor things with the favorite sprinkled in there. And how about the Oscar for La La Land? So Emma Stone comes on stage, and the first thing that is mentioned is her dress broke. There was a wardrobe malfunction. Now, not like a John Cena purposeful, hey, I'm nude except for the little thing that's covering my crack and a little banana sock. When he was holding the costume design over his nether regions. I've not seen an athletic body. I was thinking about this coca yesterday during the show. And I'm not man loving on my friend. I'm just telling you with all of the players I've seen naked in clubhouses. The only player I've ever seen with a non-steroided body as good as John Cena is Giancarlo Stan. John Cena, is it possible that he doesn't get any help with that kind of body? There were like ridges upon ridges of 10 packs and he was trying to show how important costumes are, but the irony is he didn't even need a costume. He just needed some sort of thing over his front and back. That was an interesting part. Another observation that I have to mention is that uh, Martin Scorsese took the donut. Everyone thought Lily Gladstone would get Killers of the Flower Moon, first Oscar for Native American. It would give Marty some love. 
0 for 10. And this is not new for Marty. 0 for 5 for Wolf of Wall Street. 0 for 10 for Gangs of, Gangs of New York. He goes 0 for a lot. I think he had another movie that went 0 for. The Irishman, I believe, went 0 for 10. Not a small deal to get 10 nominations. But getting the donut, I guess you just have to say, hey, being nominated was good enough. But I think it's become more of a thing than you would realize that Marty at 81, one of the oldest nominated directors, so accomplished. But at some point, don't you think he wants to win again? Given an opportunity to speak to these stars who all have to act because there's cameras, the way it works is in the theater, there's a camera right in your face when you're a nominee. That's how they get the up-close picture. It's not a pan-in. They're right there in front of you. You have no choice but to act happy when you don't win. And then you have to smile and laugh at the acceptance speeches of the person who just kicked your ass. One time, I'd like someone just to shoo the camera away or get up and leave. Eddie Murphy may have done that when he didn't win supporting actor for Dreamgirls, which he should have. But I never, when we won our sports podcast awards, I wasn't happy just to be nominated. And I don't think there was anyone in that theater last night who was happy to just be nominated, though there were rumblings that Jodie Foster and Annette Benning from NIAD were happy to be nominated, or that Coleman Domingo for Rustin just happy to be nominated. Not buying it, not for a second. So we, I'm sure, I'm going to go on Levitard when this show is done live, and I would imagine that we'll put a pin in what we did here with Metal Ark at Live from the Stained Carpet and showed Metal Ark and the executives, whether it's Skipper or Bimmel, we showed what we can do when we activate the big audience that we all have and when we combine resources and everyone shows up and actually cares. It's a pretty amazing thing when people get behind a venture. Instead of being an obstructionist, they actually try to be helpful. You have crew coming in. The control room was full. We had catering. We had makeup. Everyone was in. And look what happened. It was a success. Guess what happens when not everyone's on the same page? Yeah, that's what happens. We're still going to review a movie every day, just not today. That was our review. I'm going right into the next story here. And this is a story that will not be well covered except by me because you know how much I just love Trevor Bauer. And of course, I've got some foreskin in the game. I told you Trevor Bauer would not pitch in the big leagues again. And I have stuck to that. That is a take I had from day one. Having been in the game, you know when a player does something, that that's the end of that player's career. You just know it. A player gets canceled. Trevor Bauer has been canceled. And Trevor Bauer has spent all of his time, whether he was suspended, post-suspension, pre-suspension, making videos, trying to explain to people, hey, man, not about the money. It's always about the money, but not when you're being paid by the Dodgers. It's all about, I want a chance. Well, wouldn't you know it, Trevor Bauer got a chance yesterday, and it was delicious. He pitched for the Asian breeze. We told you he was going to do it. What we told you is the Asian breeze is a group of players who get together trying to get noticed, hoping to pitch in front of scouts. Guess what? The Asian breeze, the other players, let me set the stage here, Coca, because I don't want to get ahead of myself. There's a bunch of players on the Asian breeze who thought they were going to Camelback to pitch against and play against the Dodgers minor leaguers. And they thought that they would have a bunch of scouts watching so they could maybe get noticed, maybe get signed, maybe something. There were as many scouts watching the Dodgers minor leaguers play against the Asian breeze yesterday as the number of Oscars Killers of the Flower Moon won. Zero. That's the number of people who watched. Trevor Bauer pitched a couple innings, had a couple strikeouts. Then, after dominating people who will not be in the big leagues this year, it's the equivalent of your high school child going to pitch against a middle school team, kicking their ass and saying, look at me, I should be drafted. It's absurd. It's like like beating your four-year-old in Stratego. 
You think I'm celebrating that fact? I'm just doing it. I'm not boasting about it. But Trevor Bauer couldn't help it. He said, hopefully, hopefully, people will remember I'm still one of the best pitchers in the world. Well, Trevor, that's not the issue here. Your skill at pitching has not been the issue. It's the whole juice squeeze thing. It's the whole, I can't figure out how to do a press conference announcing you thing. It's the whole, there's no way that anyone wants to be your teammate thing. It's the whole, I can't find one owner anywhere who will give me even the minimum thing. Whether or not you're one of the best pitchers in the world, not relevant. So then he had a chance to keep talking. And when Trevor talks, it's the anti EF Hutton. It's like the HI Sutton. I mean, if you think about it, I should have the opportunity to sign with the big league team. He does. Don't need to think about it. I have an opportunity to sign with the big league team. So does Coca. So does Willow. I'm just asking for the league minimum. So am I. Coca, Willow. So far, not a big differentiating factor. If you think about it, I've served my suspension twice over. If you think about it logically, there's really no reason I shouldn't have a job. All right, this is where I stop. And I'm going to do a little lesson to Trevor. I'm going to help you right now on nothing personal. Think about your situation slightly more logically so maybe you can wrap your head around why you don't have a big league job. Let's go back to that moment. And I don't mean the moment on the field. I mean the moment when you first realized that you may have been doing something that somebody may not have wanted you to do. Let's think about that moment. How about the moment when you said, oh, I thought that that was totally cool, and then it wasn't cool. Don't players and adults, people, whatever your job is when you're doing something off the field and you absolutely realize that what you're doing is going to have an impact in your career, or an impact on your job. Has anyone else had these moments? It's called the crossover moment, where you can no longer compartmentalize the actions that you have in one place versus another, and you realize that it's gonna have an impact. I happen to believe Trevor Bauer's a smart man. I happen to believe Trevor Bauer had a moment where he realized, oh, shnikes, this is going to be a problem for me. Let me speak to my representatives. Hey, Rachel, what should we do? Oh, we're going to fight those bastards, Trevor. You did nothing wrong. Let's do it. Let's get on Twitter. Let's make videos. Let's fight left, right, and center. We're not going to bother owners or GMs. They're going to be happy. He must have been told because there's no way logically he thought of this. They're going to be happy that he's fighting for his innocence. No criminal charges, settlements of lawsuits. Everything's coming up roses. The next thing you know, he's overseas. Which is to say that Trevor Bauer's logic was A plus B equals F. F as in his career. It's f After his appearance with the Asian Breeze, he will not get an offer to pitch in the big leagues. He will not get a minor league contract. He will not ever be in Major League Baseball again. Was it because of the Asian Breeze? Not exactly, because what I could have said is 4869. Prior to pitching for the Asian Breeze, Trevor Bauer was never going to again be in a Major League Baseball organization. He was never going to be a minor leaguer, a major leaguer, an affiliated team, ever. Nothing's changing. Nothing will change. So, as he wakes up this morning, calling Rachel, Rachel, help me get a job anywhere. Rachel will say, they'll have you back overseas in Asia. Would you like to do that? Do you want to keep on the barnstorming tour with the Asian breeze and maybe pitch against the Diamondbacks minor leaguers next? What do you want to do, Trev? You want to keep talking about how wronged you've been? The Dodgers have way more important things to talk about on a side note. Way more. The Dodgers, there can be all the energies you want. That was not English. 
Dan, Dan is worried. Dan just texted me, Coca, in the middle of a show. You'd think he would re remember finally that 8 to 845 that I do a show. And it went something like this, that uh, I'm guessing Samson will be slurring today. That's funny. I'm, does he know about the 4869? The Dodgers have far more important, not slurring because I had drinks. I only had water. I think he's talking about exhaustion, forgetting about the fact that I got the same amount of sleep last night as any night. Three halls, good to go. A little cucumber water right here at the Elser. No problems at all. If you're watching on the Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel, I'm wearing the Nothing Personal polo shirt. Yes, you can get that at davidsampsonpodcast.com. Somebody's getting a piece of memorabilia. There were 49 people who beat me. We're going to pick a name out of a raffle, out of a hat, like a random number generator, Coca. And then we'll find out from New Voodoo who that person is. What should we send? What do you think? Like a jersey? Something better than a ball. I think we're going to have to do a jersey. I think we'll do that. That'll be a nice gift. And then the winner of the whole pool, there were three people who got 22 out of 23. Congratulations. That was all on lebitardaf.com. Two great websites built by New Voodoo, lebitardaf.com, davidsampsonpodcast.com. Check them out. Where were we, Coca? Dodgers. We haven't even done the Dodgers. We were saying the Dodgers have lots on their mind. Not Trevor Bauer. They did something this weekend that I want to explain. I want to explain how position changes happen. Mookie Betts is a player they gave. Coca, Mookie Betts is a player they gave. 300? Was that his extension when he was traded by the Red Sox and then re-signed? I'm going to say possibly 10 years, 300. He is a gold glove right fielder. He got 365 over 12. Right fielder, gold glove. Then last year, there was a smattering of second base appearances. Remember Gavin Lux tore his ACL out. He was going to be the second baseman. They moved Mookie in. He plays a bunch of games. We had to wait to see that he wouldn't play as many games at second base as they had thought. Spring training starts. And I told you the way we watch spring training games. We're not looking at results. It doesn't matter if, you, if Juan Soto hits 20 home runs. It makes no difference. He's not going to get a bigger offer from the Yankees. It doesn't matter if Stanton hits you know, under 100. It just doesn't matter. What we're looking for is to try to get out of spring without injuries. And we're looking to see if players are lying to us. Is there something going on where they're not? We're seeing a velocity dip for a pitcher. We're seeing somebody with the yips. We're seeing someone who doesn't have arm strength. We're seeing them bounce it in from the outfield. Hey, does your shoulder hurt? No, I'm totally fine. Dude, you can't even hit the cutoff, man. Uh, can, we, can we go to a backfield and just throw? I remember having these discussions with Marcelo Zuna. Man, you can't, you're throwing worse than my son. W what's going on? Well, it turns out that Gavin Lux and his knee injury, he has not really been able to plant and throw. For those of you who've ever played shortstop, when you go into the hole toward third base and you turn and plant to put anything on to get the runner out at first, you've got to have your legs underneath you. Gavin Lux this spring has not been able to throw properly. So then Andrew Friedman, the president of base of operations, gets together with his peeps and they say, oh God, what do we do? What do we do? And here's the solution they came up with. And it is mind boggling. Wait for it. They're 365 million, 12 year gold glove right fielder is now their starting shortstop. You heard it. Mookie Betts has been moved to shortstop. When Dave Roberts was asked about the move, he said it's permanent, comma, for now. I love that. That is straight from the PR department. That is the way you can always go back if he plays two games there. Hey, it was permanent for two games. Permanent for now. It's beautiful. That's how I feel about everything in my life. It's permanent for now, and then it's not. Shortstop is a critical, critical defensive position, as you know. Getting offense out of the shortstop position is outstanding. 
it used to be that there were all defense shortstops, very little offense. Then we got into the age of A-Rod and all of the other shortstops who were plus the offensively as well. Obviously, the hope is Mookie Betts can continue to be an MVP caliber player at shortstop. But the responsibility at shortstop, the range required, he's got the arm, gold glove right fielder. But it is totally different footwork outfield to infield, and it requires you to practice. The footwork at second base is different than shortstop. And they're playing it off like, hey, it's no big deal. He hasn't played shortstop since he was a pitcher. Double plays. Who covers the bag on steals? The footwork around second base when you're approaching it from a different side of the bag. Where you're the cutoff man, instead of being the cutoff man at second base for right field, you're the cutoff man in shortstop for left field, center field. Everything about what you're doing on the field is different by moving to shortstop. And don't forget, there's no more shifts. He's always got to play on the third base side of the bag before the pitch is made. That's a rule that will continue this year. And I think that we are woefully underestimating the difficulty in just becoming a shortstop. It's insulting to shortstops. And this is not me in any way saying that Mookie Betts can't do it or that he shouldn't do it. It's me saying that Gavin Lux really has a problem with his legs and with his arm, therefore, because to do this to Betts, now he is a team player. He is someone you want. You want him. The willingness, we've asked players to switch positions before, and some people are into it. Some people are not. Some players are good at switching positions. Some are not. We don't know what Betts is going to be. We would sit with our executives. Then we would go to the field people, the manager. We would go to the infield coach. We'd go to the outfield coach. And we would go through the options. We'd have our player development people in the meeting. We're going through all the options we have on the 40-man roster, all the options in the minor leagues. Who could play shortstop? I think they still have Miggy Rojas. And I think they just signed uh, Kike Hernandez for $4 million. So, And he's played some short. So there clearly are, there is optionality at the shortstop position for the Dodgers, but you want your best bat and you want him playing, obviously. So once you have the internal meetings, you then go to the player. We would always have discussions. We go to the agent first, we go to the player first. What we like to do is go to the agent and the player simultaneously. So what we would do is we would catch a player after a workout or after a game, if it's during the regular season, and then while we were meeting with the player, we'd have an AGM or somebody in player development, somebody calling the agent so that the agent would know before the player would leave our meeting and immediately call his agent. We never wanted agents to be surprised by position uh, changes. Certainly, we'd, we would not let a player be surprised by it. It's not like Mookie Betts came in to a spring training game, walked into the facility, and he looked, and it said right at the, at the one hole, Betts. You know, one, two, three, four, six. It wouldn't say bet six. That's shortstop one through nine. I never understood why third base is five and shortstop is six and second base is four. Why do you go from first to second to third to short and then left, center, right? Why wouldn't you go first, second, short, third? It makes zero sense. The numbers in baseball, one's the pitcher, two's the catcher. First baseman's three, second baseman's four. Third baseman's five, shortstop is six, left field seven, center eight, right nine. So when you're scoring at home, or even if you're alone, you say, hey, F9. I never did P9. Not that anyone cares how I scored games, because I did score games. Because I always viewed it with my ability. How do you hit a pop-up to right field? I never really got that. I always put those as Fs. If anyone seven, eight, nine makes a catch, I'm giving you an F. So you meet. With bets, you tell him he's going to move, and then you watch it, and then you have in your mind, how long will this last? Not the permanent for now thing, but what are we going to do? And we would have a decision before he plays a game. The decision would likely be, we're going to give him 40 games. Let's see how we do, and then we'll reevaluate. In the meantime, we're making sure there's people taking infield practice who are ready on the 26-man roster. We're making sure we're developing shortstops who are going to be ready to go later in the season because if we see that Betts is being impacted offensively, whatever issues we're having, the permanent for now becomes done. 
So Mookie Betts said it's definitely a change, but it's fun too. You can't make it more pressure. It's always a lot of pressure, especially going and being a Dodger. It's a lot of pressure. So being the shortstop for the Dodgers is a lot of pressure, but I like it. He likes it. So I like that he said that comment. I mean, PR, I would have had him a little different. Of course, I play shortstop. I want to win. I want to ring whatever they need. All right. Wait to see is when I tell you something's going to happen. If it does, great. If it doesn't, okay. Mookie Betts. He will play shortstop under 100 games this season. Wait to see. All right, we take a break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about a find that took place in the NBA that caught my attention. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep telling people about Nothing Personal. Even Metalark cannot ignore the momentum that we have. Let's talk about Rudy Gobert. Rudy Gobert, you remember, was traded that insane trade that I'm completely blanking on. He went from Minnesota to Utah? Utah to Minnesota. All right. I'm not slurring. I'm just getting things backwards. Minnesota is in contention to be the number one seed. If you go on DraftKings right now, you can wager who's going to win the West. And I think Denver is likely favored, but Minnesota, I haven't checked. Minnesota could be still ahead of them. And Carl Anthony Towns is out for the year with the torn meniscus. Is he out for the year or just a month? Are you sure it's a year? I think he said he'll be back like for the second round of the playoffs, which really is out for the year. So something happened in a game a couple of days ago with Rudy Gobert, and it happened over the weekend, so I didn't get to talk about it. And the NBA immediately fined him $100,000. When Gobert had a problem with the officiating, he made the signal that we tell our players and we tell our staff members, this is what you don't do ever on the field of play. You don't ever infer it. You don't ever imply it should you choose to write it instead of speak it. You don't make this. And if you're not watching Nothing Personal with David Sampson, you don't know what I'm doing. I don't even know how to describe what I'm doing. It's when you rub your thumb against your four fingers in a motion that makes it look like, hey, money. You know the money signal? The universal money signal? Rudy Gobert looked at the officials after a call and did the money signal. Like, hey, are you betting the game? Are you on the take? Are you in any way compromising the integrity of the outcome of this game? When that happens, Adam Silver has a buzzer. I always picture this the way Jason Biggs got wired in saving Silverman when he went to dinner with Allison Hannigan and he wasn't supposed to talk about Amanda Peet. And whenever he did, Steve Zahn and Jack Black would buzz him. I believe that Adam Silver, whenever something happens on the court that involves the integrity of the game, that he gets buzzed no matter where he is. Like I'm picturing the middle of the night, he's sleeping, it's a West Coast game. And all of a sudden he's like up at attention. Ah, oh, crikeys, what do we do? Integrity alert, Bzzz. boom, 100 grand. And then they had to explain it. So they said the fine is taking into account Gobert's past instances of conduct detrimental to the NBA with regard to publicly criticizing the officiating. This is a real thing in the NBA. It's actually happening in all the sports. It happens in baseball with the umpires. It happens in football. We've done so many segments on nothing personal about this. I guess the, the solution would be to have absolutely no on court, maybe one like in soccer. Just have one guy running around, but then everything else is done VAR. Everything else is done with lines. Everything else is done with immediate sensors when a ball is out of bounds all the fighting about who's it off. All right, let's go to the let's go to the replay where the ref the NBA referees. How do you decide? Is it seniority? Have you ever looked at when they go to the side and two guys get the headphones and the third referee has to stand there with his arms crossed? Like, hey, one day can I be on the headphones? Maybe I want to be a crew chief and then I'm the one who made the call, let me be on the headphones. You can skip all that. Skip all the problems with the referees. But in the meantime, Rudy Gobert happens to 
be overpaid. Rudy Gobert happens to look at a $100,000 fine and view that as a bad flight over to the East Coast in a card game. Of course, I don't know for sure that he gambles that amount of money, but people do. <gasps> Can't be. I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering why he did that and why the NBA was so quick to find. Do you think the NBA realizes that they have a problem? Do you think that all the sports, because of what's happening with the relationship with all the gambling outfits, have you not noticed how fast the trigger fingers are now? And don't tell me it's because of technology that Adam Silver has access to different views, that he does investigations faster all of a sudden. Clear my calendar. I got to deal with Gobert right now. Like that's the number one thing on his list? No. When it comes to officiating and when it comes to people impugning the integrity of the outcome of a game, there is no due process. There is immediate action. Rudy, you are approximately $100,000 poorer. The good news is you get to write it off. Before anyone asks, you get to write it off because in MLB, at least, the fines go to charity, and so it counts as a charitable deduction. So you actually, whatever you're fined, you're only actually paying roughly, call it 55% of that. Nothing personal pick of the day. We had the Bucks minus one over the Lakers. And the Lakers, without LeBron, beat the Bucks by one on Friday. We're at 31 and 33. I have got a five-star pick today. I love my pick today. Have you been watching the Dallas Mavericks? Have you been watching what Luca? the bender that Luca is on, the records that he is breaking. He became over the weekend the first player ever, ever with six straight 30-point triple doubles. This guy's scoring at will. Five of the games in a row he's had over 35. But it's not just that he scores. A, he scores efficiently. But above that, he dishes. And he's rebounding. These aren't with blocks or with steals. These are rebounds, assists, and points. Luca, where is he, Coco, right now in the MVP discussion? Is he not second to Jokic? If not, in odds, he should be. Because I think he's having a better year than Giannis. Certainly better than Durant or anybody else I can think of. And Bede's not in the discussion anymore. He's below 65 games. If we look at DraftKings, we can find the odds. Where is he, Coco? Third behind who? Oh, SGA. SGA is really good, too. Oh, okay. Are they close in odds? So SGA is second by a long way. Lucas plus 700. I like that value. If he continues on this roll and the Mavericks continue rolling toward the playoffs, I think you could easily see Luka either come in second or even beat Jokic. MVP, although Jokic clearly is the favorite. But just watch Luka tonight. The Mavs are four and a half over the Bulls, and we are taking Luka. And if you want to do a prop, it's not a pick of the day, but if you can do a prop, I, I don't know if we can. Can you do a get a triple-double prop? Does that exist? Are there odds for that? I assume it would be plus money because getting a triple-double is so hard. Coca will get back to me if it's somewhere on the DraftKings app. But that would be an interesting thing to look at because he had six in a row, five of which are over 35 points. But still, I would assume you'd get plus money. But the pick is Mavs four and a half over the Bulls. Not the most exciting thing going on in Chicago sports right now. We get to talk about the Bears. Here's what's happening. The Chicago Bears have bought a huge parcel of land in Arlington. That's old news, Samson. What are you talking about? Why, why is that even in the show? The Chicago, let's start that again. The Chicago Bears are negotiating with Naperville. That, no, that's old news. All right. What? The Chicago Bears are teaming up with the Chicago White Sox to find financing together to build two new stadiums in the city of Chicago. Nope. That's old news, too. All right, what do we got that the Bears are doing? It just came out. It's so good. They announced no renderings. They're not going to make the mistake the A's made. Why would they make a mistake? They're not going to go to AI. Give me renderings 
for a downtown Chicago $2 billion football stadium and make sure there's a picture of Walter Payton and George Alice and Ditka. No, they didn't do that. Their president and CEO, Kevin Warren, gave a statement where he said the Chicago Bears are proud, proud. I've spoken to a lot of owners who have put a lot of money into stadiums. Not one time did an owner say, I'm so proud to do this for my community. I love my community so much. I'm proud. Nope. But the Chicago Bears are proud to contribute over $2 billion to build a stadium and improve open spaces for all families, fans, and the general public to enjoy in the city of Chicago. The future stadium of the Chicago Bears will bring a transformative opportunity to our region, SAT words always in the statements, boosting the economy, OVS, creating jobs, temporary, facilitating mega events, they're hard to get, maybe Taylor Swift, and generating millions in tax revenue, none of which we're gonna pay. We look forward to sharing more information when our plans are finalized. Guess what wasn't in the statement? I'd like to give you my imitation of Jerry Reinsdorf seeing the statement from Kevin Warren. Puts on the readers, looking down with his one fivers. What? What about us? What about the what about the combo? We were gonna go together, handing, holding hands. Total kumbaya. I thought that we were gonna split this tax revenue, that we were gonna not sunset. I thought that we were together. No, we're not. It's just you. Please. The White Sox are concerned because the public entity is quite smart. There's not enough money to fully finance both baseball and football at the same time from this one revenue stream. So they've got to find another revenue stream, create one, take part of an existing one, get a new one, extend an old one, do something. The White Sox don't want to build a crappy nothing stadium with their 78 acres on the South Loop. The Bears don't want to go to Arlington because they bought all that land, but they ain't going to pay the taxes. All that generating millions in tax revenue, guess what? That would have been the case in Arlington because they would have been private landowners with a huge structure that would have generated millions in tax revenue from them. No, no. They want to generate millions in the city of Chicago. No mention of public money in Kevin Warren's statement, which is laughable. For those of you who think the Chicago Bears are not taking public money to have a facility built in the city of Chicago, you're just wrong. They just aren't ready to tell you how much and where it's coming from. Maybe they didn't want to upset Jerry Reinstorf. Maybe they're still negotiating with Jerry and maybe the city's going to Jerry. Hey, can you put up 2 billion? They're putting up 2 billion, in which case Reinstorf would say, but the NFL has this whole loan structure. They give owners money to build stadiums and then the owners get to take the credit for it. Steve Ross, how do you do that? We don't have that in baseball. Side note, Coke, I will never forget. I sat with Bud Selig, mano a mano. And I said to him, can you explain to me why we don't have a G4 loan structure the way the NFL does? Can you explain why we don't have capital available to Major League Baseball teams where they can use it for their portion of the publicly, privately financed ballparks instead of having as owners and presidents go put syndicates together to borrow money to put into a stadium that takes away our available credit, which has a quashing impact on payroll. Oh, I get it. That's why. There's no way that we're going to let owner give owners extra money. They're just going to give it to players who will then be even more overpaid not to play. That's pretty much how those meetings go. At the NFL, it's totally different. No guaranteed contracts. So the Chicago Bears will access money from the G4. The Chicago Bears will access money from the public. And the public will have to decide, are they going to do a deal with the White Sox as well? In the meantime, it's possible that Jerry goes to Rob Manford, his best bud, and says, hey, any thought for maybe a new G4 for what we're trying to do? 
And then Rob will say the same thing to Jerry that Bud said to me, which is no chance toilet pants. You know why? It's just business. Don't worry, Jerry. It's nothing personal.